Nintendo really doesn't like the idea that so many of us use unauthorized emulators to play its games. As a company, it's remained adamantly against this idea that it could be acceptable if you already own an authentic version of the console and the game in question, which is an argument made by many people in favor of this practice. But no, says Nintendo, if you download a Nintendo game from an unofficial site, then you are a software pirate, which makes the rest of this video all the more interesting, I think. Because it turns out if you purchase Super Mario Brothers using the Wii's virtual console and then have a dig around in the files you've just downloaded using a hex editor, you'll eventually find this line right here. Which is interesting because as Frank Cifaldi pointed out in his GDC talk last year, that right there is something called an INES header. What's one of those, you may be asking? Well, INES was one of the very first unofficial emulators for the Nintendo Entertainment System created back in 1996 by a guy called Marat Fizulin. In the very early days of this project, he ran into something of a problem, because it turns out if you physically open up a NES cartridge and look inside, you'll find that each one contains not a single ROM chip, but two. And since each of these chips can be different sizes depending on the game, and in fact there's just quite a bit of unique cartridge circuitry to consider each time, it turned out you couldn't just make this stuff run inside an emulator, not without providing the proper context first. And so Fizulin created a new file format to do just that, called .nes, which as you may have guessed by now, always includes an INES header. This has become a sort of unintentional digital fingerprint. So what's it doing in an official download of Super Mario Brothers? Well, let's go back to Frank Zofoldi for that one, I think. Uh, I would posit that Nintendo downloaded Super Mario Brothers from the internet <laughs> and sold it back to you. <laughs> Now we've verified that this header exists ourselves using a homebrewed Wii to access the files in question, and as well as the INES header, the ROM content itself is identical to versions of Super Mario Bros. that can be found online, including those that predate the Wii Virtual Console. We did ask Nintendo if they'd like to comment on this and received the following statement in response. The emulation program in question was created by Nintendo internally. Nintendo is not using ROMs downloaded from the internet. However, they chose not to address either the existence of the INES header or the fact that the ROM content itself is identical to another that we'd found online, which is unusual. As Fazulin had explained when we'd spoken to him, there are typically some minute differences that you can spot depending on the cartridge version and the method used when extracting that ROM content, and there wasn't here. So why does any of this actually matter? I think that's a fair enough question. If Nintendo has, as the evidence suggests, downloaded Super Mario Brothers from the internet and then sold it to its customers, what is the problem exactly? I mean, the game works, right? And it's taken years before anyone has even realized what may have happened. Why should we care about this? Well, to answer that, I think it's worth looking at Nintendo's official stance on emulators like INES and the ROMs that players download from unofficial sites when using them. This is from a corporate FAQ regarding the use of Nintendo's intellectual property. How does Nintendo feel about the emergence of video game emulators? Here's their answer. The introduction of emulators created to play illegally copied Nintendo software represents the greatest threat to date to the intellectual property rights of video game developers. As is the case with any business or industry, when its products become available for free, the revenue stream supporting that industry is threatened. Such emulators have the potential to significantly damage a worldwide entertainment software industry which generates over $15 billion annually and tens of thousands of jobs. It's worth noting that throughout this FAQ, whenever Nintendo mentions emulators, they talk about people downloading illegally copied software which is then being used on unauthorized hardware. And that, right there, is misleading. You see, the debate over video game emulation and how we use it is a complex one, I'm not going to argue otherwise, and piracy absolutely has an important part to play in that discussion, but perhaps the one thing we should be able to settle first is that central definition. A video game emulator is quite simply a piece of software that allows one type of hardware to mimic the setup of another type of hardware. That's it. That's what it is. It's a tool, nothing more. As a business, Nintendo claims it must never legitimize emulation, which by that I imagine it means it must never legitimize unofficial emulation, right? Because otherwise, I mean, the Nintendo Virtual Console is an emulator. Is that not legit? Anyways, they go on to say it doesn't make any business sense, it's that simple and not open to debate, which is a frustrating sentence to read because every sign here points towards Super Mario Bros. on the Wii Virtual Console being a ROM that they sourced online. I asked Fizulin if he could speculate as to what may have happened here, and he came up with the following possibility. Nintendo outsources its product to some contractor, that contractor asks for the games Nintendo requested it to run, gets we don't have them in response, and goes to the internet to find them there. In theory, Nintendo should have a sample of each cartridge released for the NES, it's part of their approval process, but this being a corporate affair, the head is usually so far removed from the body that such minute decisions never get made. 
Which is an amazing thought, because this isn't some obscure title we're talking about, it's Super Mario Brothers. And yeah, as a result, Nintendo has benefited from this community, a community they typically write off as a bunch of illegal software pirates. Now once you get over how weird a story this actually is, and it is a pretty weird one, it's not entirely surprising. Time and time again, fans have done a better job at preserving gaming's history than the copyright holders themselves. You've got people like Frank Cifoldi, for example, who chased down copies of NES games that were finished but never actually shipped, games that may only exist on a couple of prototype cartridges in some guy's shed somewhere, and are slowly, inevitably decaying. There's no obvious viable business reason to hunt this stuff down and make it available to people, it's instead about wanting to make sure these games don't get lost forever. And that's why this argument isn't black and white, it's why this isn't just about financial concerns, it's why this should, in fact, be open to debate. Because if Nintendo themselves have needed to rely on fans to get Super Mario Bros. onto the Wii, then how can we leave it to them to ensure that California Raisins The Grape Escape will always be available to those that want to play it? This has never just been about piracy, it's unfair to say that's the whole story because it's not. There's also the topic of preservation to consider. And that, right there, is the debate. But I mean, Super Mario Brothers, really? Thank you for watching this week's episode. It was a little different than the last couple, I'll admit, but hopefully that's gonna be the strength of the series, variety. Uh, the idea that we can go from the story behind the stealth mechanic in World of Warcraft to why every civilization game has had a different lead designer to Nintendo downloading a Super Mario Brothers ROM off of the internet and selling it back to us, which is, yeah, a bit all over the place, I guess. Not sure where we're going next Thursday, but maybe come back and see for yourself then. All right, yeah, good. See you next time.